Hello and welcome to today's Flipgrid live event. I am Chris from Team Flipgrid, and we are so happy that you're here with us today because we are joined by Jason of the Moat Marine Laboratory. Before we get started, let me just say, if you don't know what Flipgrid is, it is a free video discussion platform for Microsoft. And we are on a mission to empower everyone on the planet to share their voice and respect the diverse voices of others. And that's why we're so excited about today's event. Moat Marine Laboratory is in Sarasota, Florida in the United States, and they believe the answers to creating a better environment for the future are in the ocean, and they're working hard to find them. Right now, we'll be joined by Jason, who is going to show us how our everyday actions can save our coral reefs and why it matters. So without further ado, here's Jason. Thank you so much, Chris. It is so wonderful to join all of you here on our Flipgrid Live event. Let's get started. All right, and we are coming to you from Sarasota, Florida. Chris, you can see and hear me okay? Thumbs up? Yes, absolutely wonderful. And we are joined by so many wonderful people here on our Flipgrid Live event. I have uh, notes here coming from people from Canada, Alberta, Canada. Shout out to you. Uh, those one of our uh, best locations that we connect to all the time through Connected North, and it is wonderful to visit Canada, Virginia, I saw somebody from Hillsborough County, Florida, which is where I grew up from. Uh, wonderful to see all of you today. And let's take a look at the map as we talk a little bit more about this and zoom in and find out where we're coming to you from. As we uh, give shout outs to the folks coming in from California, Massachusetts, Oklahoma, Arizona, Wisconsin. Oh, I wish I had some cheese curds right now. Utah, namaste to my friends in India. Bahut Danyavadar for turning in, tuning in, and Egypt. And here we are in Florida. Now, quick question. You can type into your live Q&A section to answer this for me. What body of water is located off the east coast of Florida? Does anyone know? Checking out the chat here. Get your typing fingers ready. Seeing some answers coming in. If you guessed Atlantic Ocean, hopefully you didn't have to guess. Maybe you knew that. Now, bonus, what about on the other side of Florida? What body of water is over here? It's the Gulf of Mexico. So Florida is a peninsula. We're surrounded by water on three sides. So down there is the Straits of Florida. And let's zoom a little bit more in to see where Moat Marine Laboratory is located. Now, Moat Laboratory is also a public aquarium. We're open 365 days a year. So as we get back into the habits of traveling around, if you do get a chance to visit Florida, I hope you come down and see us. Our aquarium is open 365 days a year, and you can come see some of the incredible animals that we're going to be talking about today. And it's not just our location in Sarasota that we'll be visiting. We're also going to go down to the Florida Keys to our facility down in Summerlin Key. This is a very special research laboratory that we have called IC2R3, the International Coral Reef Research Laboratory that we have down there. Now, I have a question for all of you. If you've ever had a chance to visit the coral reefs before, either on a vacation or down in the Florida Keys, gone snorkeling, maybe even scuba diving, go ahead and let me know in the Q&A section. And then also while you're thinking about coral reefs, tell me what kind of animals do you think we'll find living on a coral reef? What lives on a coral reef? What do you think we'll find if we went and visited? Maybe you've watched a television show about coral reefs before. And uh, we'll find all kinds of fish, all kinds of eels, sea turtles, crabs, of course. All of these depend on coral reefs. Now, we've talked a little bit about where I'm coming from and where all of you are tuning in from, but what about coral reefs? Where do they come in from? Does anyone know where coral reefs are found? I had somebody uh, tuning in from Egypt. So if you said the Red Sea, that would be true. Down in South Africa, you do have reefs of a different kind. I don't know if you have coral reefs per se, but you have rocky urchin reefs down there and seaweed and kelp, all kinds of cool stuff. But if you're looking for coral reefs on the earth, you're gonna go to the tropics around the equator where it's nice and warm. And take a look at the water that we're floating over right now. Is that water clear or murky? 
That is some of the cleanest, clearest water that you'll find over coral reefs. Coral reefs absolutely love clean, clear water, and they're found around the equator of the Earth all throughout the tropics. And so we're going to learn a little bit more today about how our scientists at Moat Lab research and study these coral reefs. Notice what the scientist is doing right now. Kind of looks like she's giving it an injection. How many of you have heard about vaccinations? Yeah, but she's not actually giving the coral reef a shot. She's actually taking a very tiny tissue sample from it, and she's able to take that little tiny piece of coral and take it back to the lab and learn a lot more about the health of the coral reefs because that's one of the missions, one of the jobs of our coral scientists is to study and help save the coral reefs because unfortunately, our coral reefs are in a lot of trouble. Uh, there's a lot of things threatening our coral reefs, unfortunately, but there's a lot of hope out there uh, for fixing and helping the coral reefs too. So in order to find out a little bit more about that, I need your help today. We're gonna play a little coral reef game show today and it's called Reef Quest. And I have a number of topics here that I need you to answer with me. So starting off, we've got our first topic. It's called File Them Under Sea. It's all about coral groupings or classification. That's gonna be followed by Polyp Pazula, all about coral anatomy or body parts. Then Clone Sweet Sweet Clone, all about the life cycle of corals. Finally, or next we go into Million Points of Life, all about coral reef habitats and where they're found on the globe. Forest for the Seas, all about coral reef biodiversity. Sleeping with the anemone, all about reef relationships and a big science word, ready for it? Symbiosis, we'll talk about that. Call me fish meal, all about coral reef food chains. And finally, as I said, there are some threats out there to coral reefs and we'll talk about them in waist deep. So again, get ready with your typing fingers to answer some of these challenge questions. And let's get started with our first one. We're gonna start off with coral groupings or classifications. So let's go with file them under C. Can you answer this? Animal, vegetable, or mineral? Corals, which one is a coral cousin? Which one is a coral most closely related to? Number one, seaweed. Number two, barnacles. Number three, urchins. Or number four, jellyfish. I'm gonna start my timer here after this is over. I hope to see lots of answers. What do you think is the coral's closest cousin? Now this first question can be a little bit of a challenge. So I wanna show you that we always have the option to take a hint. So eliminating some of the questions, did you think it was a barnacle or a jellyfish? Let's find out what the correct answer was. Believe it or not, <laughs> it's jellyfish. Yeah, coral, corals and coral polyps are living animals. They kind of look like plants, but they are closely related to things like sea anemones and jellyfish. They're in a weird group of animals called cnidaria, which is a Greek root that has to do with nettles or stinging cells. And that's a characteristic of all corals. They do have stinging cells, not very big ones, uh, but it's enough to give them a defense out there in the ocean. Now, the other characteristics of corals is that they are all found in the water. These are water animals, they're not plants. Most of them are found in salt water. Some of them are found in freshwater. I saw one in a lake in Hillsborough County once when I was a kid, and they all have those stinging cells called nematocysts. Can you say that word with me? Nematocysts. Now, this is kind of like bubble wrap that surrounds the corals, but instead of little bubbles of air inside of them, they have stinging cells. And those stinging cells are what they use to capture their prey and defend themselves against neighbors. Take a look at this. This is a coral in our laboratory down in Summerlin Key. And you see those little tentacles, those little white uh, stinger cells coming out. There is a coral reef fight going on. These two corals are fighting for space on the coral reef. And so it's shooting out its little white sweeper tentacles, which are just jam packed full of nematocysts. And it's using that to defend themselves because corals need light in order to live. They have a little energy partner inside of them and they use that energy partner to gather sunlight and help them grow. And they need as much of that sunlight as possible. So doing great job with our first question. Let me pop us back up to our game board and see where we're at now. Just one second, there we are. So we're gonna go up to Polyp Pazula next. Our category number two is all about coral anatomy or body parts. 
So a single coral is called a polyp. And let's see if you can tell which one does not belong on a coral polyp's body. Number one, tentacles. Number two, mouth. Number three, stomach. Or number four, teeth. Which one is not part of a coral's anatomy or body? All right, let's see what the answer is. I hope that you guessed teeth. That is not part of a typical coral's body. They're very soft. Remember, they're related to jellyfish. So they have very soft bodies. And if you think about a jellyfish, flip it upside down, that's kind of what a coral polyp looks like. It's got the stinging tentacles, of course, and in the middle will be the mouth part, and they have a stomach inside of them, but no, no teeth. They do have a hard skeleton, at least some species do. Some are soft, but most um, grow in the ocean. And you can see here some of their body parts. They start off with a single body opening, the mouth. Oop, it just caught a little shrimpy with those stinging tentacles. And then they pass their waist into that stomach-like cavity. Now, don't think about this too much, but they only have one body opening. So this is a model of a sea anemone, which is closely related to a coral. And the food goes in that mouth and gets digested. But where does the food come out? Well, it comes out through the same opening. Their food comes right out uh, their mouth when they're done, mouth, uh, done with it. But again, don't think about that too much. And let's take a look at one of our little corals here in our lab. You can see that it's caught a copepod, a little tiny shrimp. And that is the one right there in the middle. And it's just sucking that little shrimp right in and getting all the nutrients from it. Here's another look at a different coral. We put a little tiny piece of shrimp on it and let's watch that disappear right into that stomach-like cavity. Yep, it's gonna suck it right in and disappear. So corals have all kinds of little body parts on them, but they are alive, they are animals. All right, let's head back up to our coral reef game board and go on to our next category, which is all about the life cycle of corals. Clone, sweet, sweet clone. This budding is for you and you and you and you. So how do corals grow? Do they spawn? Do they bud and split in two? Or do they just break apart like a tree limb? What do you think? Or possibly all of the above? All right, your answers are coming in. And I don't think we need a hint for this. It's always safe to choose all of the above. And that's the case here. Corals are animals and they grow or reproduce in all of those fascinating ways. It's absolutely incredible. Now corals can spawn. They release eggs and gametes into the ocean and they can create new little babies just like that. And a coral baby is called a planula. That's a special name. Can you say that with me? Planula. Those babies will swim around in the ocean and they're teeny tiny. You need a microscope to see them usually. They'll swim around for a few days or weeks before settling on something hard to grow. And then once they're growing, they can actually split right down the center in two through a process called budding or cloning. And as they split over and over and over again, they form a colony and that colony can spread over the entire rocks of the reef. Now, if a big storm comes along and crashes into the coral reef, maybe a little piece might break off. Well, that's no worries. A coral can still grow from that little tiny fragment. And that's an important clue to helping save the coral reefs because our scientists have found that corals can actually be broken into pieces to help restore the reef. And we'll learn a little bit more about that in a moment. Take a look at this video though. Do you see the coral baby here? It's right there. Now I want you to keep your eyes close on that because it's gonna go by super quick. This is what we call a little ciliated planula. It's got little tiny hairs on it and it's able to zoom around the coral reef. Now we have sped this up a little bit. This is a time-lapse video, but look at that little coral baby zoom trying to find a good place to settle down and it wiggles its little tiny body into place and then slowly turns into a little coral polyp. And that little coral polyp will split over and over and over again to become a coral colony. And here I have a little coral colony that I can show you. You see where I'm pointing right there, all those little star-shaped holes? Those were all once little coral polyps at one point, and they were all from the original settling planula, and they split over and over again 
until they formed an entire coral reef colony. All right, you all are doing great with our questions. Let's move, whoops, let me back up here and get to the correct question here. Hold on one second. We're gonna go on to million points of life. Where in the world do corals seem to grow? All right, let's find out with this next question. Now I gave you a little clue when we talked about where coral reefs are found. Do they like murky water or clear water? So are tropical coral reefs likely to grow one in fresh water, two in shallow sunlit seas, three above the high tide line, or four in deep water trenches? Put your answers into the Q&A or talk amongst yourselves and let me know what you think the answer is. And if you guess number two in shallow sunlit seas, you are absolutely correct. Remember, coral reefs have an energy partner called zooxanthellae that they need in order to survive. That energy partner needs sunlight, so corals are typically found in the tropics. Uh, they're found in the Seychelles and around India. They're found around the Red Sea. They're found in Hawaii, usually between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. So if you look at a globe and find the tropics, the corals are found in between there and they like shallow sunlit water. They don't usually grow very deep. Now, unfortunately, climate change may warm the oceans and that could affect where coral reefs are found. And corals are very slow growing, so climate change has a huge impact on their growth. The other place that corals are found, of course, is down in the Florida Keys. And we're gonna visit some of our scientists over there in a moment. But first I wanna go back over to the Pacific and visit a very special kind of coral reef called an atoll. Can you say that with me? Atoll is a special kind of coral reef typically found in the Pacific. And it's usually found around an island. Corals settle around the volcanoes in the Pacific and then grow and form a fringe around them. A perfect, almost perfect circle in a shallow lagoon and over millions and millions of years, those coral reefs form and join together. Now I said corals are found only in the tropics, but there is a kind of coral reef that is found in the deep sea. I don't wanna, uh, I wanna let you know that if you live up in Massachusetts or off in Virginia, off in the Atlantic, there is a type of deep sea coral, but notice their color. What color is that? They are bright white. They're so deep down that they don't get the sunlight that the tropical coral reefs need. So they don't have that energy partner. They don't have that zooxanthellae to help them. But there are kinds of corals that live deep down in the sea off the coast of Massachusetts, off the coast of California and Alaska, off the coast of Japan, uh, just in very cold, very deep water, uh, far away from uh, where we typically see them in the coral reefs. All right, let's move on to our next category, forest for the seas. We're jamming through this game board very quickly. And reefs are often compared to rainforests because why? One, both are found in the tropics. Two, they both make oxygen. Three, they are equally mysterious. Or four, because of the diversity or kinds of life in each. What do you think the answer is? I think there might be more than one answer here. I don't know. Maybe we should take a hint. Uh, let's see. What does this board say? They both make oxygen or because of the diversity of life in here, which is the best answer? Well, they're often compared to rainforests because of the diversity of life in each, but they are equally mysterious. They do produce oxygen. Remember, they have photosynthetic algae in their tissues. And as I said, they're found in the tropics. But the important thing to know about coral reefs is that even though they are less than 1% of all marine habitat in the world, over 25% of all marine species spend all or part of their life on a coral reef. Think about all the kinds of animals that live on a coral reef, all the different colors, all the different species. You've got fish, sea turtles, reptiles, there are sea snakes, eels, all living on a coral reef. And all of these animals have to kind of get along. We're gonna do one more category before we jump back over to Chris in just a moment, and we're gonna talk about symbiosis. 
And symbiosis is a fancy science word that means when two or more species live together. And there's a couple different kinds of symbiosis that we can find on a coral reef. There's one called mutualism, where both the host and the partner get along really well. There's another kind called commensalism. That's kind of a big word, commensal, where the host is not really bothered if an animal lives near or by them, but the partner gets a lot of benefit. And then the other kind that you probably heard about is called parasitism. Fleas, ticks, those are all parasites, and you can find parasites on a reef. It's kind of gross. So let's take a closer look at this and learn a little bit more about this. And what we're going to do is we are going to match up these hosts and their partners. And to do that, I'm going to need your help. We're going to start off with the shark up here. And looking at our partners, do you think that this animal is typically partnered up with helper algae, clownfish, shark sucker fish, or fish lice? It's kind of given away in the name. Sharks match up with the shark sucker fish. Now, what about our friend the sea bass? What kind of animal is its partner? Helper algae, clownfish, or fish lice? Well, sea bass is a kind of fish, so it's probably going to match up with the fish lice. And then we've been talking about our friends, the corals and their partners. Do you remember what it was called? Helper algae. Corals match up with helper algae. And then if you've ever seen the famous movie Finding Nemo, you know that anemones and clownfish are partners, right? That's probably the most famous relationship that we see in the ocean. So anemones and corals have a mutual relationship. They both get along. Sea bass and those sea lice, oh, they're kind of parasites. It's not too fun for the sea bass. The shark is a commensal relationship. The shark isn't bothered by that shark sucker fish, but hey, that shark sucker fish gets a free ride in the ocean. And here's our little partner algae, just like the clownfish. It's a mutual relationship. They both get along. They're both happy. And then here's that icky, creepy little fish lice. Oh, they're so gross. Now, fish lice are kind of cool, though. There are different species out there that live on different kinds of fish. And what happens is you've got a, your little sea bass going along. And what happens is this little tiny fish lice climbs up on the fish and kind of eats its skin. And uh, there are even some species that will crawl inside a fish's mouth and live inside of the fish's mouth. It's really kind of weird. And that, of course, hurts the fish. Not so much that uh, it can't keep swimming, but the fish parasite gets a nice little snack out of it. And then we have the commensal relationship between the shark and the shark sucker fish. Some people think the remoras, the shark suckers, are hurting the sharks. Doesn't really seem to be the case, but they do get that free ride, and that is good news for them. All right, I'm going to jump to our last category, which is called Waste Deep, and then we're going to head on over to Chris to find out how you guys can participate in our Flipgrid challenges. So this is all about threats to coral reefs. Now, which of these is a threat to coral reefs? One, ship gratings, two, pollution, three, disease, four, invasive species, or five, climate change? Well, if you think about it, all of these are actually threats to coral reef, unfortunately. Yep. And if we take a closer look at it, we all learn that. Ship groundings, of course, are bad news for coral reefs. They take a big gouge out of the side of the coral reef and it takes a long time for those corals to heal. Uh, invasive species like the lionfish can be bad news. They originally came from the Pacific but were introduced to the Atlantic and they're gobbling up all the little damselfish and other critters that live in the Atlantic reefs, bad news for them. Of course, pollution makes us sick. And then believe it or not, coral reefs can get diseases. Coral reefs are animals, they're alive. And so they can get sick just like you and I can. And here's an example of a coral that has gotten sick. You see that big red band of gook? That's bad news for that coral. That's a red band disease. And then behind that coral, you can see it living up there in the front. The yellow kind of tissue is alive. That red band of gook, unfortunately, is killing off that little coral. And in the back, it's turned white. It has bleached. It has lost all of its partner algae and lost all of its vi vibrant colors. But our scientists are trying to help the coral reefs and they're doing it in some incredible ways. I want to show you this brief video and then we're going to learn a little bit more about how our scientists can help the coral reefs.
Coral reefs are home to 25% of marine life, but they're in decline due to climate change, disease, and other factors. Moat scientists at the Elizabeth Moore International Center for Coral Reef Research and Restoration on Summerlin Key are researching ways we can turn the tide together. Learn what you can do at moat.org research. So here's a video of our coral scientists in action. And as uh, we go over this, I want to hand it back over to Chris, and he's going to tell you a little bit about the Flipgrid Eco Challenge that we have for you. Chris? Thanks so much. This has been so much fun, Jason. And, and actually, before we get to that, I think uh, one of our favorite traditions within our Flipgrid Live events is for educators and learners and families to take a selfie with you. Uh, so before we, we get to uh, our Flipgrid, uh, we'd love for our educators and parents to gather in front of the screen uh, and, and take a selfie with Jason. He's going to be smiling. Uh, and then be sure to, to take that photo and share it with us on social. You can tag at Moat Marine Lab and also be sure to tag Flipgrid. So if everyone's ready, we're going to take that selfie. Big smiles. Everyone say Coral Reef! Coral Reef! And don't forget, tag us on social, at Flipgrid and at Moat Marine Lab, M-O-T-E Marine Lab as well. We can't wait to see your photos. We'll just give it a couple more seconds. So much fun. Amazing. And so Jason, we're getting a ton of amazing questions and we'll get to those in just a second. A lot of these questions are about the actions and, and how uh, students and families can can help, uh, you know, can, can take action on their own to help save the coral reef, um, which is wonderful because that's today's Flipgrid topic of the day. It's called Earth to Oceans Eco Challenge or Eco Actions. And we'll show you how to get to that in just a moment. But before we do, Jason, can you let educators know what they can expect if they use the topics on Moat Marine Laboratory's Discovery Library page? Absolutely. Th thank you so much, Chris. So if you go to our Eco Action Flipgrid Challenge, you can see some of the suggestions from our staff. We actually have an eco committee here that has brought these together for us. So you can challenge yourself to pick up a few pieces of litter each day or an attend a cleanup event. We organize those here at Moat all the time and check out your local organizations to see if there's one in your area. Learn how to recycle. Some plastics can't be recycled everywhere, but you can visit your local waste management program to find out how you can recycle. And you can try composting at home. Take your waste scraps from the kitchen and learn how to compost. Visit the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, to learn more or your local protection agency. If you've had a chance to drive an electric car, uh, give that a whirl. But if not, try carpooling or riding a bus. And you can learn about alternative energies. You can use natural light for at least one day a month, or you can save energy by unplugging appliances when not in use. Even when they're turned off, they can still be drawing energy uh, from the circuit. And then finally, save water at home by taking short showers, fixing leaking toilets and landscape with native plants, and run the dishwasher if you have one, only when they're full. And to find out more ways that you can participate in these eco challenges, participate in the Flipgrid and let us know what you're doing to help the planet and what your favorite ocean animal is as well. So many great options and, and ways that people can, can really help on their own. Uh, and so educators and parents, let me show you how to find the Flipgrid topic of the day so that your learners can reflect on everything that they've just learned. Uh, and my friend Eero is sharing her screen. And to get started, go into your web browser and type in aka.ms slash coral reefs. This will take you directly to the Moat Marine Laboratory Discovery Library page. On their page, they have a ton of amazing content that focuses on art projects, different sea creatures, science-related topics to help drive discussion within your classroom or within your family. And once you're there, you'll see today's topic of the day right at the top of the list, Earth to Oceans Eco Actions. If you click on that, you'll see the prompts there for your students or learners to reply to. At the bottom, there's a link which will go to an article which will cover exactly what Jason just covered as well uh, to help rem as a reminder to any learners wanting to make that to answer. Uh, and then at the lower right hand corner, you'll see the blue add topic button. And once you click on that, you can choose if you'd like to add it as an individual topic or you can add it as a group. Uh, and if you think of a group as a classroom, that's how you can organize uh, the topics and discussions that you're having. Once you've added it, you can edit it as needed to customize this topic to make it meaningful for your classroom or learning community. And then once you've added it, the fun begins. 
When you use this topic, your students will be able to reflect on those questions and submit their own video responses to share their learning. And of course, they can use all the creative effects inside of our fun Flipgrid camera. I know that there's an underwater frame that students can use, which is super fun. Uh, and so that is the way to, to use it and be sure to check it out after the event. We will post the link to the, to the Moats uh, partner page in the chat for you to copy and paste uh, so that you can check that out right after this. But now let's get to some questions. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for, for everything that you've done. I think it's, it's, we're, we're near lunchtime for a lot of uh, the viewers that are in here. So we have a lot of food related uh, questions. And so Amanda's wondering, do animals eat coral? We also have Mrs. K's grade five is wondering if it is edible itself. Uh, what, what do you think there? There is an animal that does eat coral reefs. It's famous for doing it. It's called the parrotfish and they've got big buck teeth and they can swallow living coral and they will often eat it, chew it up. And then when it comes out the other end, all that coral is gone and all that's left is the calcium carbonate or limestone skeleton that they swallowed. And so when it comes out the other end of the parent fish, it comes out as sand. So a lot of the sand in South Florida has actually been through the digestive tract of a, a parrot fish at one point or another. So you're kind of walking on parrot fish poop, if you can believe it. And then there's another group of animals. Hawksbill sea turtles love to eat soft corals and sponges, and they have special digestive tract. Not many animals can because corals and sponges have little tough tissue, and uh, it's really untasty and unpalatable for a lot of them. But uh, hawksbill sea turtles can do that. Now, human beings, we don't really eat corals. Um, in fact, uh, I don't know of any recipe for them at all. There are some people that eat their relatives, their cousins, the jellyfish. That's a delicacy, especially in some Asian countries. I've had it before. It kind of kind of has a weird crunch, believe it or not. And then a lot of people use corals, especially soft corals, for jewelry. Uh, but that has fallen out of favor in a lot of places, and a lot of corals are endangered and threatened because of that trade. So we don't encourage you to do coral reef jewelry anymore, uh, but that is what I know about how people eat corals. Very interesting. And you mentioned jellyfish, and, and when a, an Eaton School fifth grader is asking, uh, you know, they know that some jellyfish can glow in the dark, so can some coral do the same? They can, in fact, oh, do I have my video of that? Um, they go through uh, two kinds of processes. Uh, usually the one that we see most commonly is something called fluorescence. Uh, so they can, on um, special blue light or uh, deep sea lights, uh, you will see them kind of glow, especially in aquariums. Uh, aquariums a lot of times will have that special blue lighting to enhance their growth. And so it kind of looks like they're glowing. And then there are some bioluminescent species too. They produce their own light. They don't just reflect it. And so that's a kind of cool thing that you can see, especially in some of the deep sea corals. Amazing. And so Miss Mayer and Mr. Merrill's class are wondering, for, for corals that are already sick, how are they saved? That's a great question, and that's something we're studying right now. We have scientists in the Caribbean that are trying to find different techniques and methods for saving corals that are sick right now. You remember that band disease that was going around that one coral, that red gook? Well, sometimes we can create a little channel, a chisel, a little uh, fire break, a little line in the coral, and hopefully the, the disease bumps up against that break and doesn't cross over, and that's one way we can do it. And we're also looking for uh, different kinds of corals that are disease resistant. We take little tiny samples of living corals back to our lab, grow them out, and try to find the ones that are the most resistant to diseases. So if a ship does come in ground or if a coral reef is damaged, we can take those little specimens back out into the ocean, grow a whole bunch of them up, and hopefully they will be the kind that are resistant to diseases. So that's some of the things that we're doing down in our Summerlin Key facility. Wow, that's incredible. Mrs. McCool is wondering, her class is wondering, if manatees are a threat to coral reefs, both internally and externally. I saw that question earlier, and so I have my friends behind me, Hugh and Buffett. This is a webcam at moat.org that you can visit anytime in your classroom. It's available 24-7. Of course, at night, it's kind of dark, so you may not see them. But during the daytime, you can visit Hugh and Buffett, our resident West Indian manatees. And the neat thing about these is <clears throat> they are vegetarians. You can see the lettuce floating in the uh, habitat with us. Uh, and so they do not eat meat. So they're not like the parrotfish. They don't graze in the corals. In fact, most of the time, they spend their lives in the seagrass meadows, chopping up seagrass and algae. And so they're not really a threat or uh, they don't really eat corals um, of any kind, uh, but they do 
like to eat the vegetation around it and they are part of the life cycle of the whole coastline and sometimes they might swim through a coral area that's close by and then over in the indian ocean you have a neat relative of the uh, manatee called the dugong and those are more typically found in coral reef settings but again they're vegetarians too so they don't really hurt the coral reefs or have that kind of interaction with it what incredible creatures they are watching them swim behind you is amazing uh, so a common question for, for when we have uh, youth joining from all over the world, what did you study to, be, to get your job? So I grew up in Florida, so I went to the University of South Florida, uh, which is a fantastic college, and they had a biology program, which is what I studied for my degree, and went to the University of South Florida to uh, find out more about how animals live. And then I had an opportunity to come uh, 60 miles south down here to Sarasota, Florida, and take a job talking to students just like you all around the world. And uh, I like computers a lot. I like technology, so I really like Flipgrid. It's so cool. And so if you could see me right now, I have one, two, three, four, five, six computer screens in front of me, all so that I can talk to students just like you around the world. So teachers and students, you can connect to Moat all the time using Microsoft Teams. Uh, visit moat.org to find out more about it. And uh, we would love to continue to talk to you about coral reefs, about sea turtles, about manatees. We also have a virtual summer camp coming up here pretty soon. So if you're interested in connecting with Moat over the summer, uh, you can do that. And uh, there are all kinds of opportunities to reach out and connect with uh, Moat Marine Laboratory. And Chris, I don't know if I froze or you froze or maybe our time is up. So I'm gonna uh, switch over to the chat to see if uh, we're still live. And I see that uh, my friend is typing into the chat to let me know. All right, no problem. So um, I'm gonna go over to the uh, question and answer space and see if I can find one or two more questions. Or better yet, go onto Flipgrid and use our eco challenge to ask us questions about the ocean and check it out. And I have had such a blast connecting with all of you today. And uh, again, my name is Jason Robert Shaw, and that's it from us here at Moat Marine Laboratory. Thank you so much for reaching out and connecting with all of us. So thank you. And until next time, bye bye from Moat Marine Laboratory. <laughs>